Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dev Method. So in today's Rust video, we've got ifs, loops, and conditions. So it's part of the Rust programming language. It's something you got to know. So let's get into it. So if expressions are expressions that allow you to create branches within your code. So like, if this is true, then do something else, do something else. So here's an example, I wanna walk you through it. So notice on line 14 here, we've got a number. And then if that number is less than five, we print out this statement here. Otherwise, we print out this statement. So notice there's no parentheses, like in uh, TypeScript or JavaScript, you might have something like this. So no need for that here. And in Swift, you got the same thing, there's no parentheses, so kind of cool. Pretty simple, right? Let's move on. So the blocks of code that are associated with the if part are, are known as arms. Um, I refer to them as branches, that's usually what I call them, or, or branches of logic. Uh, so like this one, for example, actually runs the else statement. So when this is false, then there's else. So key thing to keep in mind is that this has to be a Boolean. This is not a Boolean, that's just a number. So that won't compile, but this will. You also may need to check for multiple conditions and then run a piece of code. So this is doing that here. So notice here, if we have the first condition and that evaluates to false, it moves on to the next. So then there's this if else, it evaluates that condition. Again, if that's false, it moves on to the next one and it keeps going until one of them is true. So if this uh, line 20, if this is true, then it executes then it executes this block of code here. And at that point, it doesn't execute the else, it just exits this if else statement. And if none of them are true, that's where again, it goes to the else at the very bottom here. So here's something that's actually pretty cool about Rust and it's fairly unique. Notice on line 16, we have this if, and then it's got the condition. However, if that condition is true, it's not just five, like we were printing out stuff before, it actually returns five into this new variable number, this let. So it's using the if expression to get a value, return it, and then put it into number. Now both branches or both arms of the if expression, if they return a value, they have to be the same type. So this one here actually will not compile because five is an integer, but then six here written as a string, that is a string. Um, so we don't know what number is, and you're gonna have to know what the types are, because again, this is a statically typed language. Okay, on to the next part, we have loops. So we have three different kinds of loops that we're gonna talk about. We have loop, we have while, and we have for. So let's go over the loop first. So looking at the three kinds, you can maybe guess what while and for might look like in this language, but loop is the special one at least to me, it's special. I haven't seen anything like it before. So let's look at that one first. So here on line 15, we have just the word loop and then a block of code. And what this actually does is print out again. And since there's nothing else stopping this loop, it's just going to keep going. So it's like an infinite loop right now. So I caution you, if you run this on your computer, remember that there's control C to exit out of your program so that you can stop this infinite loop. So now we need to come up with an example to show you how to get out of the loop. So notice this example here. Um, we have this mutable variable number, and we're gonna print again at the start of the loop. However, if the number is greater than five, then we're going to use this thing called break. So what break does is it stops the loop. So the, this loop here is the only one there. Um, and then it goes to the end of the block of loop or the block of code, and it continues on from there. So notice here, we have the number on the else statement of this if, um, we're incrementing it. So eventually this loop should break. At least that's the way we can look at it here. We know that. And then we have continue. So what continue does, I didn't necessarily need to write it here, but I just want to show you an example of it. It's going to then jump back up to the start of the loop and then run that code from there. All right, so the next part here with loops, it's a little interesting. Um, let's say you wanted two loops, like one nested inside of another. So you're gonna wanna know about this little feature here with loops, um, you can actually label them. So it's pretty cool. So the label here is on line 15 and notice it starts with just that single quote there. There's no closing quote, but you have here a name. 
And I'm guessing just like the function names and the variable names, you're going to want to use the uh, underscore in between the words if it's more than one word for the variable name. So here it is labeling that loop, and then it's followed by the colon. And then you got loop, and then you start your block. But notice here on line 19, we have this inner loop. So the reason why you're labeling the loop is that on line 25, when we reach this condition, it actually breaks out of this loop. So this is the outer loop starting on line 15, but then this inner loop starts on not line 19. And then on line 25, in the inner loop, we can break out of the outer loop. So kind of cool. So very similar to the returning of a value in the if expression, we can actually return a value in the loops as well. So here's the loop. Now I'm kind of doing the same thing over and over again, uh, just incrementing the counter. However, if the counter then equals 10, then we break out of the loop. Now here's the interesting thing. It's not just a break and continue on. We're actually returning whatever the evaluation is of this expression. So eventually counter is going to be 10, and then 10 times 2 is going to be 20. So result will be 20. And that's how that's working. And then we print it out here. So let's look at a more common uh, use of loops. Well, maybe one that's more familiar from another programming language that you've already known. So here's the while loop. So again, we have our number, and then we put the condition right after while. Very similar to if, but in this case, after running the code, that's when it does the if. It does this check, this condition. If the condition evaluates to a Boolean of false, that's when it exits and doesn't run the loop again. Otherwise, it's every iteration is doing this. So very similar to like what we did before with loop, but this time within the syntax, we have the condition like baked into this type of loop. So at the end of this loop, what it's doing is it's just saying if the number is not zero, continue printing out whatever the number is. And then we're actually counting down here from three down to one. So when it is zero, then it's going to print out this last thing here deploy. So let's turn our attention to looping through a collection with the for loop. So I'm going to show you an example here with the while loop, and then we're going to turn it into a for loop. So here's our array, and arrays came from the last video. If you haven't seen that yet, you can click on a link in the description or look at the channel and, and watch it there. We have this uh, index, meaning like which of these elements we want to then access. So the while loop here is incrementing that index. But as soon as we're at the end of it, which is the five that's there, then we're going to stop printing. And the reason we do that is that if we got the index out of bounds error, we would crash our program. So we don't want that to happen. So you can see here that we have to do this like balancing act of like, okay, check and see if this condition is true or false. And then if it's true, go into the loop. But before we exit the loop, make sure we somehow incremented or, or have progressed in a way that helps us exit the loop later. So let's look at a different example. So very similar to the last one, except in this one, we have the for loop. And what it's saying is that instead of balancing this index and uh, trying to keep track of it over the execution of the loop, we already know we're going to iterate over every element. And that's the whole point. So why not just get that element from, the, from A, from the array? And that's what A is doing here. So it's taking each element and then running this bit of code, and it's doing it in order from 10 all the way through the last element, which is 50. So let's step up our game here for a moment, and let's just look at um, using the loop, but with a new thing from the standard library that we haven't seen yet. So the standard library has something called a range. Now we'll go into more detail a little bit in the future, but um, we did this a little bit in the guessing game. So looking at line 14, we have a range instead of the array. So we just want to repeat this thing this many times. Now with the range, we're saying start at 1. So the first number in this iteration of the loop is going to be 1. And then it's saying go up until 4. But here's the thing. 4 is not actually included. So we're actually going 1, 2, and 3. Now another cool thing about ranges is that there's a, a rev method on here. And if we call rev, it actually returns the range flips it around for us, um, so it counts down, so 3, 2, and 1. And then at the very end, it does a deploy. So that's it for our loops. That's it for our if expressions. So if you guys have any questions, leave them in the comments below so I can answer them. Um, otherwise, I'm going to get to working on other things in Rust. Have a good one.